Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining the most recent webinar in the Dataversity monthly series, Elevating Enterprise Data Literacy with Dr. Wendy Lynch. This series is held the first Thursday of every month. We're making an exception today to make account for the 4th of July holiday in the U.S. here. And today, Wendy will be joined by Mark Horseman and Anne-Marie Smith to discuss how literate is literate enough. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. If you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note, Zoom defaults to chat to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change that to network with everyone. For questions, we will be collecting them by the Q&A section. And to find the chat and the Q&A panels, you can click on those icons found in the bottom middle of your screen to activate those features. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce to you our guest speakers. Mark is a data evangelist for Dataversity. From his early days as an intern, Mark's trajectory led him to ascend the ranks, culminating in his role as manager at prominent organizations, including a Alberta Motor Association, Northern Alberta Institute of Technology, and, um, and many others. So throughout these diverse roles, he has etched a path as a stalwart in data quality, master data management, and data governance. Ever eager to evolve in the dynamic data landscape, Mark has consistently sought knowledge on the latest trends in information management. Dr. Anne-Marie Smith is a leading consultant and educator in data and information management with a broad experience across industries. She's a frequent speaker in webinars and conferences and an author on data management topics for a wide range of publications. Anne-Marie's consulting areas include enterprise data management strategy, assessment and planning, data governance program development, data and information ethics, data architecture, and data quality. She has developed and taught numerous workshops and courses in her areas of expertise, and Anne-Marie holds the degrees of Bachelor of Arts and Master of Business Administration and Management Information Systems and Risk Management from LaSalle University. She earned a PhD in MIS at North Central University and has earned various industry certifications. Now let me introduce you to the speaker for our series, Dr. Wendy Lynch. For over 35 years, Wendy has converted complex analytics into business value as a sense maker and analytic translator. A talented researcher and consultant to numerous Fortune 100 companies, startups, and healthcare giants, her own work has focused on the application of big data solutions in health and human capital management. An author of books on effective communication and analytics, Wendy has pioneered the only structured system to empower a new generation of professionals who will revolutionize the successful application of data to solve business challenges. These trained analytic translators allow companies to convert advanced analytics into actionable solutions, building a sustainable alliance between analytic and business professionals. And with that, I will give the floor to Wendy uh, to start the presentation. Hello and welcome. Thank you so much, Shannon. <clears throat> Thank you to Mark and Anne-Marie for joining us today. And for all of you who are coming back, welcome back. And for those joining us the first time, we are happy to have you here. I'm gonna start this topic on how literate is literate enough by giving a little bit of background before we have our panel discussion. We're all here because we are interested in data literacy. And we're interested in part because of statistics that we hear like this that businesses with the highest level of literacy and mastery of data, uh, which includes policies and technology and people, that those companies have 70% higher revenue per person than companies that don't. When we hear these kinds of numbers, it's not a surprise that leaders tell us they want people to be literate. And that means that having all of their population from left to right, have a profic prof proficiency that includes the ability to read and recognize data, to understand that data, to convince and argue, to use data to make their points, to explain complex analytics. And then at the highest level, we want people to actually do analysis and maybe teach others about data. So it is not surprising when we hear that 90% of business leaders believe that literacy will be critical to their success and that the organization will advance if they are highly literate. And so we hear that business leaders 
really believe that most or all of their workers are already literate. This one study showed that 75% of leaders thought this. That goes down a little when you ask mid-managers. Only half of them believe that most or all of their workers are data literate, but they are optimistic. They believe in their people, that it's already there. However, they may not be looking at the same evidence that I've seen, which says that really only a quarter of employees nationwide are confident in their data skills. And actually some studies who look at people who are highly skilled, it's down to like 8%. So we have a big task to make everybody literate if we want everybody to be highly literate. And there may be some limits to this. If we look at what capabilities we are starting with. 62% of US adults operate at a very basic math level. Worse, one in five admit to having severe math anxiety, so much so that when they look at them on a functional MRI, their brains register math in the same way that they register physical pain and fear. Some studies say as few as three out of 10 are able to interpret. Well, actually three out of 10 cannot interpret a simple graph and understand what it says. Plus we have some levels of finger pointing. So we hear that we need to focus on certain types of people like those from the social sciences that tend to go into human resources or sales. So we have an environment where leaders overestimate how literate people are. People have much less data ability than we think they do. There are barriers and then there are uh, finger pointing and blaming for who it is that's a problem. It reminds me of the 1980s when companies started to believe that fitness was the answer for their employees and they would pick skinny people to tell them that weight loss is easy. They would pick fit people to tell them that exercise is easy the same way that now we pick all of our favorite nerds and I include myself in that category to tell others that data literacy is easy. So let's look at a couple of other types of literacy so that we set a stage here. So let me first start with a concept called strategic alignment that I will also rename business literacy. And that is where all the people in the organization understand the purpose and goals of what the company wants to do. Now, we understand that this is important because all of the business journals tell us so that employees have to understand the strategy. They need to know why they do what they do. And there are statistics again in this type of literacy that say that when you have a company where everybody is aligned and has high business literacy, their revenues grow faster and they're more profitable. So if we again look at the population from left to right, and strategic alignment, or also known as business literacy, that what we want is not only for the population to be able to do their job, but they wanna connect their jobs to critical performance indicators, key performance indicators. They want people to be able to understand and communicate what the business strategy really is then tie their decisions to the key aspects of that strategy. And then at the highest level, actually create strategy that will align with what the business objectives are. And so when you ask executives, they are again confident that most of their employees can obviously explain business strategy. One in five executives have high confidence that most employees can explain their company's strategy. 
but how many really do? One study showed that fewer than 30% could correctly choose their own company's business strategy from a multiple choice list. Another study showed that 13% of frontline managers in a large organization could name their top three business priorities. And one study by Price Waterhouse said 93% of employees could not articulate their company's strategy. So we have overconfident leadership who knows how important this issue is, but overestimates how many people are actually business literate. So once again, leaders in the boardroom believe that strategic alignment, business literacy is easy because they said so. So let's just do one more type of literacy. I'll call it people literacy, the ability to understand the emotional and social circumstances in themselves and people around them. We see in business journals that emotional intelligence is really critical. In fact, they look at successful people in business and find that 80% of predicted job success had to do with emotional intelligence, not intellectual intelligence. Managers that have high emotional intelligence and interpersonal awareness have higher revenue. And over half of HR leaders say that they're starting to hire managers based more on their people literacy than on their business acumen. So what is people literacy? Well, again, if you have all the people left to right with abilities going bottom to top, it's not only being self-aware about your own emotions and reactions, but also recognizing them in other people, empathizing to what they're going through, having the social skills to navigate other people's reactions and emotions, and then guiding others on how to do that effectively. So it's not gonna surprise you. How many people actually have high people literacy? Again, studies say that about a third of people can accurately recognize and identify emotions in themselves and others. 95% of people think they are definitely self-aware, but only 10 to 15% really are. Now, this particular type of literacy is more important than you might think to data efforts. So, there's 90% of companies who say they're accelerating digital transformation, which means adopting new platforms, new tools, new methods, new uses for their data. But 70% of transformation projects fail. And according to Forbes, the reason they fail is because of people issues, not because of technology, because they've overlooked what it takes to have people react favorably and adopt new strategies, new approaches, new tools. And if we're finger pointing, we can finger point right back. People majoring in science and business, so data literacy and business literacy have the lowest levels of empathy compared to people, for instance, in HR. So while there are some who would say emotions are easy, again, we're in a situation where fewer than a third. So what we want is for all our people to be highly data literate, highly people literate, highly business literate, but where we actually are is fewer than a third data literate, fewer than a third people literate, fewer than a third business literate. So as we talk about literacy today, I wanna to keep in mind 
that we all have different strengths. We might be highly data literate, but not so much people literate or business literate. Or we might have great people literacy and not so much of the other things. And every person has a different combination of strengths and weaknesses. So what if our CEO is highly business literate and people literate, but not at all data literate? Do we lump him with these other people who have low green bars, which are the data literacy and tell them they have to go through data literacy training and this is the most important thing that they need to do? Do we take the people who have low people literacy and put them into communication training and empathy training? Do we take the people with low business literacy and put them into remedial strategic training? We can't simply look at data literacy by itself. And so we will also talk about whether if you're an expert in one thing or another, that may make you look really great to the people who are like you, but the business person who's not data literate has a problem and the data person who's not business literate, literate has a problem. So what is it that we do and how much do we need them all to be at the same level and how much is enough? So it's with that background that we are going to start to talk about how literate is literate enough? And I'm gonna start with a question. Using an analogy like food or music or anything else that you want, please describe the level of data literacy that most workers should have. And why don't I start with you, Anne Marie? What kind of an analogy would you make to describe how literate in data literacy does a worker have to be? Thank you, Wendy, first for inviting me to join this panel discussion and second for starting with me. Okay, I like food. I also like music. So this question says I could choose one or the other, but I'm going to choose the food analogy because everyone has to eat <laughs> to live. And as a result, I think that there's an analogy for different levels of food literacy that can be attributable to data literacy. Every one of us, no matter what else we do, has to understand what types of food are nutritious and good for us, what types of food are good for our particular situation. Are we, uh, do we have celiac disease? Do we have an immune disorder that requires us to eat a little differently, et cetera? And we all have to understand those relationships between food and us as people. That's an, a, a, probably a baseline level of literacy. I would add to that, that most people should be able to um, cook at a simple level, just basic, how to boil water, how to use a microwave, et cetera, what goes in a microwave and what shouldn't, that basic level of literacy. Raising it up a bit, there are people who really need to be able to read a recipe well, a more complex recipe. Everybody should be able to read a very simple recipe, but not everybody needs to be able to read a more complex recipe. You might be cooking for yourself. That's a simple recipe. You might be cooking for a family of eight people. That's a probably more complex recipe. So they have to understand how to do that. And they have to be able to shop, not just for the simple foods at the basic literacy level, but at a slightly more complex level. And then taking it to another level, like you did, Wendy, with all of your gradations on the slides here, that we have a level of people who have to be able to interpret a recipe to help others. 
Not everybody needs to be able to teach how to cook. But the people who do need that level of skill need to possess it to a fairly stringent degree. And if you're in a position with food that you have to really manage a large budget, you have to be able to shop accordingly. I could take it to more detailed levels, but I think those few levels of food literacy help explain where there's a base level that everybody should have. And then higher than that, there are other levels that you may or may not need or want. Okay, I like that answer. I have a couple of rebuttals, but I'm going to wait oh, on that. I'm going to wait on that. And uh, so, Mark, what analogy did you come up with? Yeah, so so those of you who know me know that I'm a, a bit of a nerd. Um, my nerddom knows no bounds, I like to tell my friends. Um, and when I saw this question, my, my favorite analogy for this is actually competitive card games or CCGs, collectible card games. Um, back in the 90s, I was a, a professional Magic the Gathering player <clears throat> for a hot minute. And, and these days I play a lot of Hearthstone, which is a different card game. But uh, when considering these types of things, uh, these, these card games, you, you construct a deck and that deck leads you to victory in your game. Um, your victory is all structured around a certain goal. So how does your, your deck of cards that you construct achieve that goal? And so you look at every type of card or ability or resource that you can use to put in that deck to achieve your goal of winning. Um, and, and that's a fascinating example of literacy because the, the better you are, the more skilled you are at these games, the better you are at constructing a deck and, and understanding what cards go in that deck to help you achieve your your victory condition, your goal. Um, so when we're talking about data literacy, what are the skills and abilities that I have that I bring to the table as resources in my role such that I achieve that goal in that position? Um, otherwise, I'm playing a few cards short of a full deck. <laughs> and you mean that literally and figuratively. Exactly, it was a great joke. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly, exactly. So I, I'm struck by um, both of you saying that you need this level. And then still, it sounds to me like what you, you would hope for them to have. Because there are a lot of people who just walk into the convenience store, grab whatever is on the shelf, whether it's good for them or not, and survive just fine. And there are people who don't really care about um, whether or not they're excellent at cards, whether they are going to be very um, good at that game. And so you are implying a level of desire for health or well-being or uh, achievement that may or may not exist. So how, how do you respond to that? Mark, start, Mark, start with you. Yeah, like going back to that analogy that I have, like your your goal to achieve victory, uh, your winning condition in your deck of cards uh, uh, could vary depending on your role within an organization. So some roles are going to need a certain level of skills or a certain set of resources to apply to a, a situation or, or their position in their company than others. So uh, I, I like that. I like how you set that up, and I, I like how you set up today's webinar, too, where we talk about uh, business literacy and people literacy, because when constructing that that skill set, constructing that value proposition, um, you, you may include various different levels of uh, skills and abilities for each of those main pillars. Yeah. Yeah. What about you, Anne-Marie? I really am interested that you mentioned, Wendy, that you could walk into the local convenience store and pick up just whatever and still thrive and be just fine. First, I would say I'm not sure that's correct. You may survive, but I'm not sure the word thriving is correct, but I'm not a nutritionist. So <laughs> this is just my lame person lay not lame lay person stance um i would also say that 
if you are just going to the convenience store constantly and not eating anything truly nutritious, that you might not have that basic understanding of thriving. You might not, you don't know what you don't know. And if nobody's ever explained to you the difference between eating to survive and keep your heart and other organs functioning at a basic level and eating to have a, and you know, you can breathe well, you can act, you can move well, you can think, et cetera, all the stuff that helps people yeah, I, work. I really um, like that, Anne-Marie. And, and one thing that I'd, I'd like to add to that is um, as we were talking, setting up this uh, discussion, I was uh, talking about a camping trip that it, we had done this weekend and going to the corner store and being able to do something in a corner store re food related is, is an interesting analogy. Uh, so we were making a Caesar salad, uh, but nobody bought and brought any Parmesan. It's really, there's no way you're going to get Parmesan out in the wilderness, but there's a little camp corner store that has little snackies and little things. And so we walk in there off chance that they maybe have some suitable cheese. And um, because we're food literate folk and, and I pretend to be a foodie sometimes, uh, we see uh, a, a bag of Parmesan garlic potato chips, kettle cooked Parmesan garlic potato chips. And then we all think to ourselves, hey, we could crunch those up and and top the salad with that as a substitute for Parmesan. So when you have that literacy level, um, it opens up your ability to think through different situations and apply different skill sets and be able to contribute to a team's success in a different way. Mark, that's great. Now I'm really hungry. I would like a Caesar salad when we're finished. Don't. <laughs> Schultz posted that everybody should be familiar and comfortable enough in a kitchen or restaurant and a grocery store to feed themselves and those they are responsible for. However, what that looks like for each person will vary. That's a true statement, but at a base level, it probably shouldn't vary too much. We all know we need adequate water. We all know we need adequate protein. We all know we need adequate fruits and vegetables you know the pyramid not everybody subscribes to the pyramid but people basically should know that and the fact that you're food literate mark you were able to go into that camping store and find parmesan kettle chips that became the topping of your salad that's a level of food literacy that not everybody probably needs. I'm not a camper, but I can see other ways where it would be helpful. Yeah, I still, uh, and we'll move on to the next one. My my analogy would be travel. Um, that you need to know where you are. You need to know if you're lost. And you probably need to know how to find someone who can help you either read the map or tell you where you are or translate to the language that you're in. So I'm not necessarily certain that you have to have all the literacies, but you have to be aware that you don't have it and trust a person or have a person that you trust who can help you. Because someone with no food literacy at all could have a chef or personal shopper or somebody who is taking very good care of them, whether they are or not. So I am going to still push back a little bit that we are talking about what we hope that people would have to be self-sufficient and whether or not that can happen, I don't know. Wendy, I really like your point about having a guide for various forms of whatever literacy we don't possess. And I will admit, I never thought of that. <laughs> Thank you. So um, number two question is, so what is the ultimate purpose? I mean, we can say we want people to be literate in whatever ways that we're talking about, but, but what is, why does it matter? And, and, I go back to this question all of the time. So there's the ideal and there's this um, 
this belief that we want people to achieve these certain levels of whatever it is, of fitness or smarts or food literacy or whatever. What is the purpose, Mark? What what is why do we need literacy? I have a punchy statement here, so maybe we can spark a little bit of debate. But I think in the context of uh, an executive team, I feel like the purpose and and why it matters of data literacy is that if somebody is asking for knowledge, information, and data with which to make a decision, they understand the work that goes into providing that so many times. And I'm sure everybody in chat has heard this as well. You get asked on a Friday afternoon for a report on the trends of whatever, and, and the analysts get that and they go, oh my gosh, I can't, I, there's no way I can get this done by the end of the day. This is at least two weeks worth of work. So I, I feel like the purpose of data literacy is so that we all have a common understanding of data and data related things such that the analysts can provide something that the executives can read and the executives can ask and I've been torched for saying it this way several times so that the executives can ask literate questions. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and I should be torched for saying it that way. That's not a very nice way of putting it. <laughs> no, I, I, I get what you're saying. What about you, Anne-Marie? Actually, I think that the purpose of data literacy in 2024 is more fundamental than that. I agree that Mark's statement about people asking questions in a literate understanding manner and having some idea of what they're asking for is important, but I think we can take it back even farther. We live in what's been termed the information age, and many people don't know how to find the right statistics, let's say, for a decision they have to make, let's say personally. They don't know how to interpret opinions versus facts. They don't know whether the, quote, testimonial that's coming over them, oh, coming to them through social media or some other form of outlet is based on a verifiable source. They don't know how to verify sources. And they don't know how to interpret those results to help them even perform simple things in their daily lives. So I think we have to come back to the purpose of data literacy is helping people navigate the world we currently live in, which is becoming more and more information intense. So I agree with all of you. I agree that it would be great to have those things happen. The question is, is can we get a busy executive to a point where they actually are going to know the difference between one very difficult question and how much it will take compared to another very difficult question? I mean, are we really gonna elevate them to that level? Or, and you're going to hear this again and again, what if they have a trusted person who understands where they're coming from and understands what the analysts have to go through, who has become an ally to both sides so that they aren't yelling across the chasm that, no, we can't do that. Yes, you can. No, I can't. Why do we have to elevate everybody to the high level rather than having a good translator in the middle. Wendy, maybe it's recognizing that you need a translator. Got it. Recognizing yeah. what, that you don't know what you don't know. And good being point. comfortable in that recognition and identifying who that guide is. So maybe the level of literacy that we need is the level of people or the, the level of understanding that you don't know. Yes. I think you might very well be right. Okay. So specifically, and maybe this will be come back to your ask literate questions 
uh, comment mark, but how specifically do you know that somebody meets the requirements for being literate? I mean, what, so how do, if you're not gonna run an assessment and I know there are bunches of assessments out there, but you walk into a room and you're not quite sure where you are with people, how specifically do you observe something or hear something or, or um, notice something that tells you whether somebody is literate? How about you, Anne-Marie? Oh, Wendy, uh, one of my roles here is as a consultant. So I'm going to use the consulting expression, it depends. <laughs> And you can yeah. smack me, but you're far enough away that it might not be easy to do. Um, I think it really depends on the role and recognizing that nobody knows everything and that everybody contributes something to a situation and recognizing what that contribution is. And sometimes that contribution might be that data literacy that comes from data acumen. Sometimes it might be, it might come from really the job of being a data analyst or a data scientist. And sometimes it might come as the translator guide that you mentioned a few minutes ago, Wendy, as that's the role. If you're an executive, I would hope that, and there you go, there's that word hope, mm -hmm. that the executives would understand, I don't know everything. And that's why I have assembled this group of people to guide me in one way or another. But I don't know how to make the requirements specifically. I think that depends on the situation more than anything else. Yeah. Mark, what about you? How do you, how do you know that somebody... I, I think I think there's a hidden danger in this question and, and that would be the the dunning Kruger effect um where only a real competent person or or literate person in this context would be able to assess the literacy or competency of others and so if if we're not careful in our self-reflection uh we can all suffer from from that sort of assessment I think um, the only way to specifically tackle something like like knowing if the folks around you are 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 literate enough or or literate would would really require a certain level of lifelong learning in folks, uh, keeping your skills and abilities sharp to some degree so that you can recognize the sharpness of others. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't really ask your question. I guess I could just ditto Anne-Marie and say it depends, <laughs> except, <laughs> except I'm not a consultant. So, uh, so I, I use words like ditto. <laughs> but, but Mark, the Dunning-Kruger effect is really something important to recognize. And it stems from mm -hmm. being sufficiently self-aware. Yes, exactly. To admit yeah. that you don't know everything and you have some level of awareness of what you don't know. Which is why I like Wendy's slides from earlier when, when talking about the different literacy levels and emotions are easy. Y yes. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> for, for the non-empathic folks. Yeah, yeah, they are. Yes. <laughs> and, and when I go into meetings um, as a translator and debrief afterwards, the non-data people say that the data people are not being very empathetic and understanding of what they are going through. Whereas the data people are talking a lot about how dense the business people are and un unknowledgeable. And so we do have all of these different types of literacy that appear in the exact same meeting over and over and over again. Wendy, I have an a real life situation that corresponds to what you just said. One of my sisters is a critical care nurse practitioner who is in charge of a major hospital's cardiac criminal critical care unit. She is not business literate. She doesn't understand economics and marketing. 
but she really understands the environment of cardiology, critical care, nursing, the skills of her staff, et cetera, and can interpret the data that they collect on those points and thousands of others easily. Her husband is CFO of a medical supply company. He doesn't understand what she does for a living other than she's a critical care nurse and she do he doesn't know the data that she knows. But he does have a very deep background in finance and economics and to a certain extent, some levels of marketing. Yeah. And each one of them knows what the other knows. Each one of them knows that the other knows things they don't is the better way to say that. Yes. Yeah. And I think, well, this is a great conversation, I think, for all of us to have. And I think we have to keep in mind that we're all literate or illiterate in so many different areas that we can't just focus on one. And that example is a perfect example. The CFO and the critical care nurse may or may not um, really understand what the other person is going through. And if they have respect for each other, they don't really um, suffer from that lack of knowledge. There may actually be a curiosity that arrives from that. But in many meetings that I go to, there isn't a lot of um, acceptance and curiosity. There's just irritation. I think that that comes in, in some part, Wendy, from people being scared. They're afraid yeah. to admit what they don't know. Oh, I'm supposed to know everything. Right. Well, and there's, there's um, depending on the culture, there could be real punishment for that. Yes. As opposed to appreciation for that. So let's move on to this question. Um, uh, where do we draw the line on any of this? So... Um, we've touched on it a little bit, but if we could describe, okay, we're going to go to here, but no higher as a, as a requirement or as an expectation, is it that um, we want people to get to an understanding where they can, they can hear about a certain level of, of data or a certain type of graphic but asking them to actually know what the statistical significance really means or asking them to know um, some other methodology. I mean, should everyone know what AI really does and how it's done at every level? Um, because I have seen some places saying they want everyone to be able to know basic analytics. So, so Mark, what is the unrealistic level? Yeah, and, and there definitely is an unrealistic level. Uh, are, are, are we going to walk up to an executive and ask them to describe us what a zero-weighted Poisson distribution is? That's definitely ridiculous. So yeah. because ridiculous exists, there's definitely a line somewhere. I, and this is why I like my my card game analogy. If the the goal for my for my deck as part of my role is to achieve a certain victory condition i i don't need the card that says i understand zero weighted poisson distributions it's just i understand what this data is telling me so i i think it really depends on what your goal is uh what what the purpose of your your job role and function is uh, uh that helps define what that level of data literacy is and and i think that base level is just a, a basic understanding of the supply chain of data and what your roles and responsibilities are with that supply chain. So am I the clerk that enters data into our enterprise system? And do I have an understanding that that data ends up on a report on somebody's desk? And how is that, how is that uh, data used in the supply chain of, of knowledge in the organization? I, so I think that's where your base level is and depending on what your your job role and function is, you may have a couple levels on top of that. 
And so you would d make it by job role. Um, yeah. I, expectation. I, 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 yeah. Yeah, I would. I think that that's where I would lean. Okay. What about you? What about you, Anne-Marie? I would take what Mark said and carry it a little farther. Not only job role, but persona. Several people in the chat are posting about personas. And I agree that there's a difference between personas and roles. And the it depends statement depends on the persona you have and the role you play. Um, I think that there's a basic level of data acumen. I don't want to use the word literacy as much as acumen at this really base level. Mm -hmm. If I am the clerk Mark mentioned a minute ago, I need to understand that what I'm doing is collecting data that the company will use. And that there's a need for me to collect that correctly. And here's what correct means. And here's why correct is important at a very basic level. And using Mark's supply chain analysis analogy, here's where it's going. And maybe that's the basic level of literacy that role and that persona needs. And that is fine. And then we go to other roles and personas and discover what's really needed for that role and that persona. Does everybody need to be a data scientist or a data analyst? I would submit that 90 some percent of us don't. But for the few percent that are data scientists and data analysts, they have to have a very deep understanding of the data in the organization and data in general and statistics and other things that most of us would run away screaming from. So what it, I still I still hear a certain level of of onus on the individual and I think um, there is a level of onus on the individual but as a translator I work with people who have very little understanding of what the whole process of analytics is about. But if I earn their trust and tell them what is possible or not possible, whether that answer is reliable or not reliable, I can help them make decisions about that. I can also help the analytic person who knows very well what all of these things mean develop empathy and understanding for the business priorities that they don't have. And I'm not sure that that executive is ever going to get really capable of understanding. I've met many really brilliant business people, uh, one of whom could not understand a bar graph. Their brain just could not do that. But verbally, they could understand what, what the issues were. And I know a lot of analytic folks, and there are a few who really don't get why their absolute truth may not apply given the business circumstances. So where does that fit? I mean, if, if there really isn't that necessarily that capability to have the people literacy or the data literacy, wh where does it fit? Um, do they just, they, sh they should be different. They should have better levels. To, to kind of go into the card game analogy one more time, um, the, the, they do team-based games they call two-headed giant. And, and in that kind of context, often what you'll do when you're constructing your, your strategy is you will pick complementary strategies. Um, I'm deficient in this, so I need a partner who excels in this. Mm -hmm. And I, and 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 that kind of gets into into analytic translators a bit too, Wendy, because you're absolutely right. Some folks may not need the ability to understand a particular visualization, 
uh, but it would be incumbent on a translator to be able to describe that to an analyst and say, hey, we need a different visualization for this so that it speaks to the person who's trying to read it. Yes. Got it. Agree. You, you and Marie? You say I agree? agree completely with Mark and you, Wendy, about the need for translators. Um, I have absolutely no skill in graphic design. I can develop good training with right content, but I can't present that training well visually. I'm just not skilled there. But I have the assistance of lots of people who are skilled in that area who can take what I've done in content and turn it into something that's not only aesthetically pleasing, but useful in a learning experience. Those people are great because they can translate themselves. But sometimes we need a third party, an intermediary to help discern what I was trying to teach to the graphics people who actually can turn that into something visually useful. Right. So I think a lot of times we, we either don't know that translation is needed or we just think it can be done by each side rather than relying on that very valuable third party. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think you're illustrating that you feel very comfortable in domains A, B, and C, but, but you are very aware that you're not that great at area D. Yes. And, and the fact that you say, look, that isn't my strength. Maybe the minimum amount of literacy, as you said, is to know when you're lost and when you need help. And be willing to accept the help. And say and say that you need it. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's the basic level of literacy, Wendy. You might very well be right. <laughs> it could be. So as we move into the next uh, question, and we may have almost beat it to death, but my question here was, um, if we have people who are experts, um, is a translator the, the solution versus telling Mr. Analyst on the left that he needs to now become good at people skills and business skills and the person on the right, that they must now become data literate and people literate? How do we think about the parallel minimums of different types of literacy and what do we require from data professionals? I'll, I'll, I'll start on that real quick. Uh, just in my career as a, as a data governance manager and, and a professional data governance person, my largest success has always been being able to speak enough business words to secure funding for um, program. Uh, so I, I would I would say that business literacy to a point where I can go and give a presentation and achieve uh, support and sponsorship for something that we're trying to do in an organization um, is is uh, is a good bar for uh, data folks. And I know we have to wrap up here soon. Anne Marie, your your final words on what should we expect of um, data professionals with regard to the other types of literacy? Um, similar to what Mark just said, I think it's a. I think every data person should recognize the areas where they are competent and the areas where their acumen isn't as strong, and be comfortable enough with that knowledge to reach out because data literacy in part is about knowing how to interpret content and some of that content is people skills and some of its business literacy got it so um, we will wrap up here um, I know that we have taken almost the full hour and I, it, for me, this was a great discussion. 
um, to hear about where you guys are um, on the needs. And I think we've um, heard each other, what we would like to see, what we hope to see, what we can achieve, what other kinds of support we might need. Um, I think a lot of uh, different perspectives uh, and being aware of what we don't know may be um, part of the real critical issues here. So I wanna thank Mark and I wanna thank Anne-Marie. I also want to um, remind people they don't know that very soon, hopefully in the next 30 days, uh, we will be launching an analytic translator training. If you also believe that there is room for another professional to help bridge this gap, um, we will be launching analytic training very soon and communication for data professionals who want to have a little more of those people uh, literacy skills um, will be coming soon after. So I will stop there. And Shannon, do you have wrap up to do? I do, Wendy, thank you so much. And thanks Emory and Mark for joining. Just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by the end of day. Um, well, we're gonna try to get it out as soon as we can given the US holiday is the fourth. So we'll be out of office on the fourth, but stay tuned for uh, the follow-up email, which will contain links to the slides in the recording. Um, there are some questions, but so let me just throw in here one here. Um, for the for the panel so how do you develop translators in-house and prevent spreading them too thin if they're in very, very high demand wendy maybe we should start with you on that yes um i think that there will be an optimal uh, depending on the the rate of projects coming in there will be an optimal number of translators uh, who can facilitate the kinds of discussions that need to happen between the two teams or more than two teams um, I am finding that it, uh, one translator for a team of around six to 10, depending on volume and, and the size of projects, um, analytic people is a really good number. Um, but uh, sometimes uh, they're even more useful with executive teams and leadership teams because it helps them be more um, considerate and appropriate in their requests. And, and and yeah. training, sorry, the, the other part of the question, training um, can be at any individual who goes through the training um, and they can they can go through it on their own. My my best recommendation is you should train in two so that they can practice skills on each other. Oh, I love that. Um, Anne Marie or Mark, I, I know um, this is more of a question for Wendy, but any comments, anything you want to add in the next? Well, just just quickly, um, I, I, I'm a really a huge fan of Wendy's approach here, and and I like how the questioner uh, wrote this particular question. I think if he, if this type of person is in very high demand, that's a good problem to have, as uh, having more translators within an organization, um, and and filling that role is going to to help ease the stress on both sides uh, of that literacy equation, uh, the, the folks who are trying to communicate and the folks who are trying to listen. Perfect. Anne-Marie, anything? I agree completely. The more <laughs> the merrier. It's, the, yeah. it's a wonderful skill to have. And I think more organizations would be much more adept in data with a translator culture. Agree. Perfect. Well, thank you all again. And to Wendy's point, we will definitely have that up this month. We'll be, stay tuned for a, an announcement. We'll get all the analytic translator um, content up to Dataversity. Uh, the training.dataversity.net. So stay tuned there. Well, thank you, everybody. Again, really appreciate y'all um, joining and speaking today. Thanks to all of our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. Just love it as always. Wendy, thank you. And Anne Marie and Mark, thanks for joining us this month. Thank yes. you. Appreciate. Appreciate all of you. Thank you. Most welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Have a great day. And for those in the United States, have a great 4th of July and holiday weekend. Cheers. Thank you.